thank you very much everyone uh, for joining today's talk. Um, so, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Robert uh, Bichotsky from the University of Bristol. Um, Rob is a professor in the School of Computer Science, Electrical and Electronic Engineering and Engineering Maths. Um, he's kind of interested in uh, various aspects of connected systems, um, particularly connected and uh, automated vehicles uh, and also uh, wireless sensing of ETH Health. Um, it's obviously working with uh, BT on the NGCDI project and also on another project called AIM. Um, this is kind of the, the last in the current series um, of thought leadership talks from the NGCDI project, but if you have not um, kind of caught all the previous talks, um, then they can be, uh, the recordings can be found on the NGCDI website, um, which I think is ng-cdi.org. Um, so please check there if um, if there are kind of previous talks you've missed because there's, there's been uh, lots of very good talks in this series. Um, so, um, OK, thanks very much. Over to you, Rob. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Thank you for, for, for the intro. It's absolute pleasure and joy to be with you uh, again. Uh, um, well, we obviously hoped to do it in person is what it is. We, we try um, to take the most from from the uh, the circumstances. So. Um, I, I do not plan to fill entire 60 minutes. I'm, I'm trying to um, cover it in about 30 minutes, 30 plus. That's that's the that's the aim, so that we have enough time for, for, for discussions. Title is a differentiable digital twins, and it's it's a sort of part two to the talk I gave last year. So so there will be. Uh, um, well, there will be further th thoughts on the topic, further results. And and I actually reused one slide from from last year, so I'll I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going to reach that point. Uh, here is the plan uh, for today. Uh, I will talk a lot about twins, uh, various aspects of it. Uh, I will take you also on a detour. Uh, so the, 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 I'm hoping this will be a, a scenic route. Uh, there is a, uh, and I'm hoping you're going to bear with me. Uh, because initially it may look as as a as a really uh, big detour. There, there there is a purpose to it, and then I would like to uh, finish off with setting up the discussions. So you know, caveats, challenges, where do we go from there? Essentially, okay. So the, the starting point really is what we already know, what is well accepted uh, within the community, and I think the best way to do that is is to just define the digital twin. Uh, like a classical definition of a digital twin, and I, I'm gonna quote um, IBM definition because I think it, it captures it reasonably succinctly. So uh, uh, forgive me, but I'm gonna read out. I think that, that that's probably the best way to do that. So that, that's the IBM's definition of a digital twin. A digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical entity or system. The digital twin is much more than a picture, blueprint, or schematic. It's a dynamic simulated view of a physical product that is continually, continuously updated throughout the design, build, and operation lifecycle. The digital twin and its corresponding physical object exist in parallel, evolving together as the physical product progresses and matures. Okay, so the kind of um, two key things. You know, it, it, well, it's a twin, and it, it's continuously refined, updated. OK, so that's that's the kind of uh, starting point. And I will add that definition as we go along. But before that, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, um, disclaimer. I, I'm, I'm going to use digital twin uh, interchangeably with world model. I, I titled this talk last year uh, world models. Uh, this is really the same concept. They, they are subtle differences, and, and, and I, you know, if there's a time, I, I comment on it. And also, uh, last year, I used predominantly learnable. Uh, there, there's a difference. So the, the, this year, I'm using a differentiable. Again, there, there's a subtle difference. I, I think differentiable is a, is a it, it describes the concept more aptly. Um, and very briefly, Differentiable simply means we're going to use, when we update the model, we're going to use stochastic gradient descent. So the function we're optimizing and the whole chain is differentiable. So, you know, we, we're working with completely within the framework of the deep neural nets. Learnable, this term itself does not really imply. OK, it's a, so differentiable is a subset of, of learnable. 
Okay, so with that, um, just very, very brief history. Where do these things come from? Uh, digital twins is not really a revolution. And uh, if you trace back ancestral lineage, uh, we're going all the way to kind of most fundamental simulations. And I, I tried to think myself, what, what was the first thing I, I typed, you know, when I was undergrad and that I could consider with a kind of um, pinch of salt, a digital twin kind of protoplasm, that's this, more or less this, what, what I typed in a MATLAB that was already there, uh, MATLAB, I think version three. So this is the first simulation, okay? So, you know, communication channel, and these type of things already were happening whenever computers were created, so it's 1960s. So literally you can trace back all the way to this first attempt to simulate little things. That's where the digital twins come from. Um, and NASA introduced big software package at the, at the time, uh, Nastron, which uh, added a lot of functionality to this simple uh, simulation. The entire concept of model-based systems uh, engineering was created. Uh, I try to trace back when the word the digital twin was actually coined. It, in a written form, it does uh, appear around 2012, 2013. But apparently it was used uh, earlier on in a presentation by this person. So I'm going to give credit where it's due. So that, that's where apparently uh, the term comes from. But it's not in a written form. So there isn't any um, sort of solid uh, citation. Anyway, from about that point onwards, we see increasing uh, uh, interest in the twins and application. And it's not a coincidence that this has also happened at a time where GPUs became popular. Uh, where NVIDIA, in fact, released a CUDA framework, so to unleash the, the, you know, the processing power of, of uh, GPU cards. Uh, and for the last few years, the world has gone crazy, basically, uh, for digital twins. So they always feature in sort of top 10 uh, technology trends. Uh, so yeah, we are, we, we are with it now. Uh, okay, so where, where digital twins are used? Basically everywhere. Um, it's it's in automotive, uh, computational fluid dynamics for for aero, ship, uh, in design of planes, manufacturing machinery. Uh, you name domain, you will find it there. Even in healthcare, and you, you might have heard about um, uh, the Brain Project, massive European uh, uh, project, flagship European project. In essence, that's what it is. It's a digital twin of a human brain, you know, the human brain project. Uh, but it, oh, I, I, I had a uh, pleasure participating in one of the eHealth project, big European project as well, where we also looked at um, digital twins of a heart. And it, it's a big research to, to my uh, amazement. It, it's incredible amount of work has, has gone there to the design those twins. Many, many more. OK, so. I uh, will now add a little bit to the definition and try to contextualize it uh, and make it specific for what we have in mind, which is uh, digital networks. Uh, so what, why, why do we want to have digital twins in, 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 in a network? Oh, simply because they, they are indispensable tools uh, for development testing of specifically for AI uh, powered networks. And this is happily uh, um, coincides with uh, open run, that's another buzzword that, that it's, it's being now um, ma making, uh, you know, to, to our research and application area. And open run simply means it's a software. And since it's a software, it's very easy to be twinned. So, you know, that this concept kind of matches very, very nicely. And I'll also be making uh, predominantly references to controlling. So using digital twins to develop controlled policy specifically meaning sequential optimal decision making. OK, so okay, analogy I use a lot is a driving a car or developing policy for driving automated vehicle, because fundamentally it's, it's at least mathematically the same uh, problem. It's the problem of sequential optimal decision making. You know, in car, the decisions are effectively control of the vehicle. You know, the, the car has only two degrees of freedom in terms of control. It's a steering wheel, uh, left, right, one degree of freedom and accelerate, decelerate. Um, the state space is very complicated. Here, we obviously, we have the action space is massive in, in, in networks, but again, it's a sequential optimal decision-making problem. 
and uh, often um, well these days we are interested in developing those those control policies uh, out of the data itself so this is a machine learning framework more specifically reinforcement learning uh, framework this is a very difficult problem um, we know well we, we read in popular press how difficult it is to design uh, control policies for automated vehicles exactly is the complexity of the state space uh, and and it's similarly difficult for designing control policies for networks so why digital twins why are they useful uh, they're useful because you know we can train agents within those twins that's the whole point and so we we um, what we're having in fact is to train ml models we need data data is in fact abundant what is not abundant is the ml grade uh, data uh, which means labeled and curated digital twins directly provide this okay so the way to think of this is you know digital twin is an attempt to convert compute into data they are also cheap scalable fast uh, cheap wise just software scalable it, it means you can you can instantiate multiple twins run them in parallel and you can run them in in time which is faster than the real time okay you, you only again you only limited only by your compute safe again that's very key uh, it, it's pretty obvious nobody would put untrained software on an automated vehicle and let it run in or, or, or in, in a city uh, the same for the same reason we would not do it on your on your on your network um you know you need to put it in a sandbox environment uh counterfactuals uh, that's simply the ability to go back in time and check what would have happened if different decision had been taken okay and then then roll the time from that point onwards that's the only way really to do exploration and exploration is the key to performance so you explore for different actions see where they lead and the only way to do that is to have the ability of, of the, this counterfactuals and hk says again the only thing you learn learning something meaningful if the case is a bit weird okay and i i want to also be very specific uh, and define this this differential uh, in front so this is one example how differential twins can can be created so i'm hoping you can recognize this is a neural net uh, it doesn't render on my screen that well, but I'm hoping you can just about see it. it's, a, it's a neural net. And the way we can create a differential twin, so basically, you know, create this twin purely completely within the, 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 the neural net is you may, on one side, you might have a standard digital twin, like this simulation package. So in comms, often what you want, at least in wireless comms, is some software package that uh, um, tells you something about propagations mechanisms um uh, maybe in a city like manhattan section or over here and you may also want to have mobility patterns how users move around okay put them all together uh, this is a digital twin or of some sort and but on the other side on the other hand you can also have a database of things you know reading off your network directly so the trick here is to treat output of the twin exactly the same way as you would treat as database lump them on together in one data set and train your your neural net with this okay so that's the kind of one idea how to get a differential digital twin yes out of both the database and and, and the standard uh, digital twin okay second reason so that's that, that's clearly very appealing uh, feature and the second in, in my mind very very good reason why you want to be doing this is uh because we already have a plethora of uh, fantastic hardware and this is coming it's growing every month every year there is this new hardware platform that accelerates all these computations again this is driven predominantly by deep learning but you know the, as i said since we are directly implementing digital twin as a deep learning model we, we, we're taking full advantage of it it is the image from Microsoft lists all those latest hardware platforms and I'm not going to pretend I have uh, expertise in, in this field I've heard of few of those uh, but in, in all cases these are um, you know highly parallelized uh, hardware platforms that you know ranging from FPGAs to application specific integrated circuits that that offer incredible acceleration 
uh, as opposed to standard CPU. Um, and second thing uh, uh, I want to say, so, sorry, maybe just, just to uh, finish this off is with that, you don't only get the speed of execution, you know, this acceleration implies speed of execution, but the speed of development coding as well, because alongside hardware, there's fantastic um, packages, software packages being developed as well that accelerate the, you know, the, 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 the development time. So those two come together, it's the development time, and then once you develop your code, the, the execution time. And also energy efficiency, that's another thing. Um, this, they are get, these things can, can do um, you know, uh, tera operations uh, per second at, at, you know, on, on watts, on a single watts. It's absolutely incredible. So that's all very good. And second thing I just want to uh, signpost here is uh, you may say, well, OK, deep learning, what, what can we do with deep learning? There's only certain things you can do with deep learning. But you know, we can actually uh, let our imagination, uh, let it run wild. Uh, knowing that deep neural nets at, at the bottom really are universal function approximators, which really means whatever function you have in the network, even if you're happy with it, you know, you, you know there, there are theoretical proofs that's optimal. You may think, why would you want to replace it with deep neural net? For these reasons exactly, and since this is universal function approximator, in principle, we'll, we'll can replace approximate any function you want, even um, stuff that you already know, uh, you know, because it's been proven 20, 30 years ago is optimal. So this is uh, in principle possible as well. And especially functions though, that may maybe implementation implies single thread. So there are plenty of those algorithms, say V to B, you know, um, algorithm, it would need to be implemented in a, typically in a single thread. Why not work it on a deep neural net? Because you get all these benefits. Okay, so with that, I'm going to discuss and present, uh, show you a few examples of differentiable uh, uh, digital twins. And this is the, this big detour we're going to take uh, to start with. But I'm hoping it, it, it's a kind of nice, uh, cute, cute uh, example. So I'm going to talk about sensor fusion uh, uh, problem. A sensor fusion problem occurs in many applications in, in actually automated vehicles. So what specifically what I'm saying is imagine you've got, say, um, a radar, a camera, maybe ultrasonic, and there is an object in front of the vehicle and the vehicle wants to make sense what that thing is using multiple uh, modalities, uh, as we call them. Uh, but that's not, not the only application area. In e-health, it happens as well when we want to have a multiple um modalities again maybe cameras wi-fi radar and so on and we want to glean uh for example physical activity uh of, of a person of, of interest okay so um traditionally the way uh i'm sorry i'm gonna make a connection with 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 how the brain so specifically how human brain operates uh traditional view of the perception of human brain was that you know our, our eyes and ears they, you know see the world as is and try to make sense by just literally processing and, and guessing what is the object that is in front of it increasingly uh, neuroscience provides us evidence that not it's not really what's happening in in a, in a human brain human brain in fact is a massive predictive predictive machine and most of our functions, uh, subconscious functions, are in there to build a world model. That, that, that's what, what most energy is being burned into, is to creating a world model and then guessing. And in fact, perception itself is, is then an attempt to uh, provide the best guess for the causes of the sensory inputs. Okay, so in, in some sense, what's happening is, as I said, the brain builds, continually refines the world model, what that is, and the perception is a result of this combination of, of taking the prior knowledge of guess by this predictive machine and just refining it with the input uh, from your eyes, ears, and so on. So th this works in tandem, and that's what produces the final guess. Uh, so that's that's a kind of very nice, cute, but it's also um, can serve as an inspiration for for prediction or predictive or uh, tasks or sense of fusion tasks that we want to do in industrial contexts. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show next. 
So this is stuff uh, coming actually from our latest paper that I was, um, apologies, it's not available yet. As I said preprint because it was meant to be available before this talk, but uh, I, I messed it up and I didn't submit everything. So the, the paper is ready, it's just not yet, should be ready in the next few days. Should anybody want, it will be available for, for download. Um, anyhow, so what I have here is, uh, is kind of three, uh, or two maybe classical approaches to sensor fusion, and the third one that is inspired by the Bayesian brain hypothesis this, this is our stuff. So um, let me uh, discuss the first one. So option A, it's called decision fusion. Effectively, what we have in here is, so imagine X1 and X2 are this data coming off modality. This may be camera, this may be radar or whatever you want. Um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, sound and vision, uh, both um, being emitted uh, from the same object. Okay, so again, that's the underlying assumption is we're fusing the data because we want to make sense, uh, you know, for example, uh, provide a decision at what object we are looking at. And a classical um, framework, what we would have is a several layers. F1 is just the feature layers. So it's some sort of processing pipelines, extracting features. And at the end here, you would have a, a decision so in, in probabilistic context, decision just means a probability distribution of all possible objects that there may be. Okay, so in the simplest case, if we know there's only two objects in the world, cats and dogs, and the output might be in a 30% dog, you know, 70% cat and so on. Here's the same thing. And then since there are those probabilities, and we can invoke independence, technically this is conditional independence, then we can multiply probabilities. And that, that, that's literally what decision fusion, how it works. We just multiply, take point-wise product of those probability mass functions, renormalize it, job done. That's decision fusion. Feature fusion, it's a kind of slightly different technique. What we do is the same pipelines, uh, but we don't uh, do, we don't make the final uh, decision uh, for each of these modalities. We just fuse them all together and then make it later. And here's the third one that is inspired by Bayesian brain hypothesis. And I know there's lots of arrows because it's, it's a little bit messy. It's trying to uh, show several things in one go. It's how it works and actually training process uh, as, as well. But the, the point is that in, in this, uh, uh, we, we define here latent representation space. So there's this kind of abstract a notion of, you know, if you close your eyes, if you think what, what might be, for example, dog or, or a cat, uh, that, that's a kind of the closest I can think of. And importantly, this is the, the this world model, this kind of digital twin. Obviously, it's not digital. You know, our brain doesn't work in, in, in zeros and ones. But you know, I, I hope you, you know what I mean. Yeah, you know, this is the, this uh, probability of all possible things that may happen in the world, and 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 you you know you have some prior understanding what could happen. And the point is then that the final decision is taken by uh, combining this this prior probability and fusing it with whatever your modality tells you all and, and combining it all together into one thing. I'm going to have a few, few equations now uh, to make it a bit more specific, hopefully, and not to confuse you. Uh, so in this particular context here, the probability of everything is literally this. That's what I mean. It, it's a probability, so in this case, is a density function of the latent stuff of the data coming out of the object, um, but in this instance, I'm saying we don't have access directly. This is the true data coming of the obsess, but we we are observing that this data through some other function that can be possibly lossy, uh, can, can drop data, or can, or for example, have occlusions. Okay, that that's normally what happens in real life. You don't have access to clean data. That that's what, what you get. So. These are these three objects, and I have a probability over everything. And because of that structure, this you can just about see this Markovian structure from Z through X and Y, I can factor the whole lot like this. Whenever you can factor joint distribution, you can then take advantage and, and try to approximate this joint distribution because you've got some factorizations of something you, you, you can stab it with. Otherwise, if you put that and they're all highly dimensional, it's pretty much hopeless case. Um, but since you've got this factorization, then there's a hope essentially. Uh, and how do we do it? So how this whole thing works? 
this whole thing works by uh, creating, in fact, this uh, differentiable digital twin, as I said, uh, uh, of this distribution. And literally, it's a big neural net, actually several neural nets, and it's train of the data. That, that, that's really what it is. Specifically, the particular structure is a multimodal variational autoencoder. It needs to be a generative model. Uh, multimodal VAEs are, are best for this particular uh, task. So those parameters, size and size, are literally the weights of, of your neural nets. There's lots of neural nets in there. And then just to state the problem of perception itself, uh, as I said, uh, the problem of perception is just guessing of, of the of these causes. Um, you know what what might have caused my my eyes to 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 look at and whatever that was. So literally that that's just stating it mathematically. It's a maximum uh, a posteriori estimate. So you know there's max uh, over z of my latent stuff for all these things that I, I I may see. And if you unpack it, plug these equations over here. And that's what it really looks like. So it's just a statement of the problem. It's not a solution. Uh, solution is tricky, but, but it's, it's doable. You've got this additional integral because, as I said, we don't have access to X, this full data set itself. You know, there may be all different things, objects that there may be. So, you know, the proper way to handle this, this uncertainty is to integrate this out uh, with all these chains. OK, I want to show you how it works. So with all that introduction and the first one is a cute example is it's a proteins so again so we are still on the detour uh well we'll come back to comms in, in a second so uh what, what i have here is a uh, proteins uh you may have heard in the last two years there was a quite a lot of fuss uh about alpha fold so a machine that predicts uh, 3d uh, shapes of proteins so that served as a kind of inspiration for this work but what we've done here is kind of simplify slightly the problem. We don't have the resource of deep mind, so we simplified it and make, make the proteins smaller and also make them only 2D. It doesn't change literally the, the problem, whether you have, you know, in real life, obviously they are, they are 3D, here are 2D. So if, for example, this type of protein, uh, this one is a 64 uh, molecule long. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's the angles in between those molecules that define uh, the proteins. So, they, you know, 63 dimensions uh, to this problem. Alpha fold works in a very similar way, but obviously this have much higher dimensional. But fundamentally, the problem is the same. It, it, it's, you know, it's a stochastic geometry, really trying to guess those. And, and the task is to guess the shape, what this thing is, because as in the real life, the shape of protein defines it, its function. It's the shape that, that matters. Here we're doing the same. And to make it more interesting we are saying that okay we don't have full full access to all those uh, little numbers they're impossible to measure but we have only access to some uh, very very small subset uh, to these numbers some only very few measurements and as unbelievable as it looks we can reconstruct these shapes with only two measurements okay so there are only two de degrees of freedom two dimensions that i have in my measurements and i can reconstruct uh, you know, the, this massive protein uh, that has a, uh, you know, that the, it, the, the full set would require uh, 64, technically 63 uh, uh, measurements. So it seems like a bit of magic. And the reason why it works is exactly what I described earlier is because we're not op operating in this space. What we're doing is first, we, we, we are assuming we've got uh, millions of millions of proteins and we're learning these differentiable twins of the world of proteins. So we know what they tend to look like. And we, um, you know, we, we, we're making effectively very good guesses based on this little scraps of information we, we, we are getting. Here's how it works. It's an iterative process. It's a stochastic gradient descent. So you can see that um, uh, the initial guess, the degree one, uh, is something that already looks like a decent uh, a protein. And after many, many iterations, the final is the blue. And you cannot see the red. I can just about see the red because it, the, the blue covers completely the red. So you know the, the reconstruction is is nearly perfect. This is the more close to home example. It's exactly the sense of fusion. Very similar algorithm than before. So what we're doing here is just to compare, evaluate how that works uh, compared to this decision fusion technique that I said earlier and feature fusion. Uh, all these uh, examples over here are one or the other, and this is um, the metric here is is, is F1 uh, macro kind of typical 
uh, uh, metric that, that evaluates accuracy of, of, of the decision making for human activity recognition. And this works very well. You may see those numbers are not fantastic, but this is because the, the, um, the modalities are individually very lousy. This is problem, we don't have the time to go into it, but this is pa passive Wi-Fi radar. So the problem uh, here is um, we are assuming there is a Wi-Fi router, we only mine backscatter. Even with that, we can uh, have a pretty good idea of what the person is doing, what activity. Okay, so Wi-Fi, passive Wi-Fi, it's, it's not a very informative uh, source of information, but e even if, and despite not being very good, we can do very, very well using this approach that I've just described. So, you know, building those those digital differentiable or differentiable digital twins. OK, I need to speed up because I'm actually. Uh, taking longer than I thought I would be. OK, so I'm, I'm going to skip. This is the one slide that I, I showed last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to describe this algorithm. Uh, this is AlphaGo. Uh, AlphaGo, that uh, is fantastic algorithm. I'm, I'm going to skip it if people are interested, and we, we can talk about it later. Uh, what I want to say is that what we have here and what I showed last year, we used the second version, second generation, that it used itself uh, for self-play purposes and was developing uh, control policies. So you can think of it as a this is direct twin of, of itself. OK, so we're operating again with him, the same framework. We, we're creating a twin because effectively there's a rule of the game and we know we're within self-play. So we're training in a digital twin in some sense. Interestingly, the latest version, Mu0, it actually doesn't use the rules of the game. It kind of uh, learns them as we go along. So again, we have a differentiable digital twin, the neural nets that learn not just the policies to play, but also the rules of the game. Why would you do it? If you already were given the, the rules of the game, obviously that doesn't make sense. But the point is, uh, Museo was shown to play not just AlphaGo, it's the same algorithm that also played chess and checkers. And I think there was something else as well. And obviously at that point, uh, it's just marvelous because you don't have to provide the rules of the game. It will learn. Uh, how these things can be used. OK. so. What I'm going to show here is just some of the results that are, well, they're already a few months old. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too, too much on them, but th this is um, uh, a problem of resource management in open run using deep RL uh, agents. Um, so the, the one that I mentioned at the beginning with that open run, and specifically what we want to hear uh, do here is uh, this is a um, kind of um, the simplest visualization of what open run is. You know, you've got the base stations, and the base stations now are essentially your only ears and mouth. They don't have any brain. They only listen and and they talk. The, the brain is removed and it's there in, in DUs and CUs. And what we want to do is now just pass over this computational effort up there and fulfill all the demands that our users and EUs may have to provide good service to, to, your, to, to your users. So all of that can be actually uh, reframed as a, as a bin packing problem. That's, that's the technical word. Um, and that itself is a game. That's what I'm trying to say. Bin, uh, no, bin packing is a game. Yeah, th think of it as a Tetris, so playing multidimensional Tetris, Tetris actually concurrently. There's, there's a number of Tetris games being played together. And since it's a game, you can use AlphaGo. OK, I've got a few more slides. Um, so this is more recent work coming out of the project. And this is, uh, again, differentiable digital twin used for uh, prediction. Uh, so what is the problem? The problem is we, we want to have a tool that provides really a good prediction, um, you know, signal strength in a city, uh, multiple different reasons, purposes of that. Uh, no time really to discuss them all, but you know, it's a very useful thing. But it's not just the prediction. It's also it's a generator, meaning it will try to learn um, also distribution so that you can turn it into a sampler. So it will give you 
uh, samples coming out of this distribution. The reason why you want to have it is because that's exactly what you need when you train RL agent. You, you need samples coming from some you know, distribution that approaches the real life distribution. So in this example, what we've, what we've done is combined um, uh, open street map. You know, the, the, we, we, intuition tells us that you know, if you know where the buildings are, uh, then that will have impact of how the signal, um, you know, where the signal is strong, where it's weak, because obviously signal interacts with buildings, so there's the, sh the shadowing effects in there. So there is information there that can potentially be mined. Uh, on its own, is not good enough because you would need to use all these other old classical uh, propagation models that are not that very good, quite frankly. There's always some caveats in there. So ideally, what you want to do is also have some data, and that's where uh, M. Um, oh, correctly, where is it? MDT, I think it's called uh, the the data. Uh, so minimization of drive test. Yes, that's what it is. I finally remembered that. Um, MDT, yes. So M MDT data comes in, uh, and what we're trying to do is combine those two ideas. Um, so uh, create um, a model that will uh, sample, will generate this data. Um, but sample, in some sense, you can think of it as being regularized. By, by this uh, OSM map. And again, we don't have that much time to go into details, but it works pretty well. So um, here, this is the, the, the average error. Um, so it's smaller is better. MLP is the multi-layer perception, is just this layer, just one neural net that doesn't benefit from the, from the OSM map. And you can see it, it, it's better. OK. I'd like to start wrapping this up. Um, so, uh, time to discuss challenges. What, 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 what is there uh, to be done for these digital twins to be a valuable tool? There's been lots of challenges, but I will concentrate on on one that is, I think, extremely important and it's often neglected, and that's the uh, same to real uh, gap challenge. So, it, well. It's pretty obvious. Intuition tells us that for the tools to be, these tools to be really valuable, your twin needs to emulate reality as close as possible. It's pretty obvious uh, why, why you need to do that. But it's also pretty obvious that uh, it, rarely this will be possible. You know, your digital twin will always have some gap. Real world always changes. We only had one case, and I showed early on this, uh, you know, where digital twin uh, closed that gap, and that was the game of Go. Where you are giving the elected the rules, in reality you're never going to have it. So there will always be a gap. And the trouble is that when you train RL agents uh, on on some environment and this environment changes, uh, things can go really wrong. And here's an example of how things can go wrong. So what we have here is is an algorithm. This is actually the same algorithm that I showed earlier on for uh, playing Tetris game resource allocation. And what we've simulated here is, is a kind of chain. So imagine that the blue one is what your agent experienced, this distribution um, you know, histogram, for one particular value. And then you put it on a real network and the distribution changes. You know, so this, this is the data distribution shift problem. So this is orange, now happens in reality. So you can clearly see that there's something different. So with that small change, uh, what would have happened? How the agent would, would have worked? And here we see an example. So in blue line over here, I have um, a training curve. So this al um, algorithm is being trained. This is a reward, this is a metric that tells the algorithm how well it's doing in kind of key performance indicator. And at some point we reach uh, T0, and we might say, I'm, I'm happy. This kind of 32 reward is good. That's all I wanted to have. Now, always what you're going to do next is a validation period it means you, you stop training you stop fiddling with your weights of, of your neural net you keep it fixed but you let it run experience some more time in the same simulator and you see yes that's all looks very good i'm happy it's been validated for long enough hopefully it's been exposed to all different conditions put it on your real network and this happens there's a data distribution shift because real life is different than your simulator and disaster strikes this thing drops off okay so that's that's a kind of visualization of what will happen so how can we elevate this problem what can we do about this yes so as i said one is definitely you will always try to do build your digital twin as close as you can to real life then there is additional set of of tricks you can do and here we actually put a paper 
uh, it's on archive that discusses all of them, what you can do. There's a list of them, different strategies that you can deploy. I will kind of pick up uh, for the lack of time uh, two, but I'll mention three. Um, so the first one that I'm going to mention only is the policy transfer. So essentially, what, what that means is um, you can build a kind of function that will change the, the distribution of policy. This is two, two options, so either the data or, or the policy. And if you're lucky enough uh, that you have paired examples between those two domains, then you can, you, you can build that, that function. So here, in the simplest case, is imagine those two are Gaussians, okay? You can estimate really that, uh, wow, what, what could have happened here? Gaussians are described by two numbers only, mean and variance, so just linear transform that you need, okay? So to, to change the variance, you, you know, you, you, you just fiddle with the standard deviation and add or uh, multiply the, you know, the mean and, and you shift one to the other, job done. Okay, so it's a linear transform. So uh, in reality, obviously, you will put some neural net, but again, you could only do it if you have paired examples. Uh, in reality, you're not going to have it. But that's, that's just that's just what's going to happen. Uh, so what else we can do? One is a domain randomization, and I'll show you in a second what that means. Uh, and the second one I think is pretty cute is unsupervised or unpaired domain transfer, and I'm going to show you what that is as well. Okay, so here is the what I would consider the most successful uh, story in domain randomization. And this is a reinforcement learning agent working for real on a pretty high end and safety critical application. It doesn't get more safety critical as a nuclear reactor, does not it? So what we have here is a tokamak nuclear fusion reactor. Uh, this one is, sits in a, in a research lab at EPFL in Switzerland. So this is actually collaboration between DeepMind and EPFL. So Tokamat uh, fusion reactor, what, what it has is it looks like a donut over here, a donut shape. It's in you know, a nuclear fusion. Effectively, what this tries to do is create plasma, so superheated uh, gas, millions and millions of safety grades, and emulate the center of a star. Okay, where a where, you know, fusion happens and energy gets released. Uh, so that's the key point. I'm not going to pretend I have expertise in this field, but what I understand is the shape of the plasma is key. So you know, how do you, you know, control the, the shape of this thing? And the only way realistically to control is using magnets. So those, those rings around are magnets, and they're all together, I think in this reactor, were 19 of them. And the way you, you can control the magnetic field is by adjusting the, the voltage on these magnets. So the action space is 19 dimensional and you can control the shape and control reactor. Uh, but the key I want to say is what these guys have done is they trained entirely in a simulation. Okay, So they, they, they had a super accurate simulator to start with. Had they super accurate because the EPFL guys were refining the simulator for the last 20 years. So it's super, super accurate. And and another things I'm gonna uh, I'm listing here what, what they've done is in the training they actually also varied a little bit of the simulator so they said um actually we may not be hundred percent sure about one parameter so we're gonna do is not use that parameter but we use expertise and just put some distribution over these parameters so distribution was handcrafted so we can sample different parameters and the hope is that somewhere within this range lies the real one. So, you know, when, when, when real life happens, it's been already, the simulator has been exposed to the, the real one. That, that's the whole point. So that's essentially domain randomization. Here it is called targeted uh, parameter variation because, you know, expertise was used. It was not dumb, you know, Gaussian, add, add dumb Gaussian noise. It, it was more of a handcrafting going on in here. And the second thing is uh, what's called the learned region avoidance. And the point is, we already know certain configurations of, of, of voltages to prevent a disaster striking, like zeroing voltage of all, uh, all, all coils will probably make this plasma do something silly. I'm not sure it will fall to the ground, but you know, we'll do something silly if there's no magnetic field to contain it. We'll melt the whole thing. So we know certain configurations, you cannot use them. Again, the, the trick here is a zero shot transfer. You literally train it, Put it on reactor, fingers crossed that there is no meltdown and it, 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 there's no meltdown. Incredible work. 
And the second, that's, that's my final slide, is, is this, is unpaired domain adaptation. Uh, so uh, let me just explain this picture because that's where it, it, the idea comes from. Idea comes from completely a different field from image to image transfer. Idea being that, uh, well, let's say we, we would like to turn, for example, in a picture, zebras into horses or the other way around. So how to create a function, some neural net that will do that? Or maybe uh, change some image from a different style. Okay, Monet into Van Gogh, you know, so paint, or Cezanne into... Ukiyoe, I think that's pronounced this way, this Japanese art. And anyway, you, you know what I mean. Change completely the style, the style change. Now, you're not going to have paired examples of this. You know? uh, Van Gogh never painted exactly the same picture than Monet. So you're not going to get these things. And the same here. So how can you do that? Um, and the same here. You're not going to have exact the same sort of presentation in, in, in your image of, of zebras and horses. You're going to have millions of images of horses. But each of them, you know, even if you stripped off the color, would be different than, than, than zebra. So here's the trick. Is this the, um, domain adaptation that uses two GANs, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, working in tandem. Very briefly, uh, the, the trick here is you, you, you're effectively training these things together. This is domain one, domain two. And uh, a generator, as, it, as, as generator in GAN, is actually a translation function over here. So we take some domain one, translate it. And here is a GAN that tries to, uh, sorry, the discriminator that tries to distinguish whether this came uh, from the real data set or transferred um, from the other domain. You do it um, in a kind of cycle, adding a few more tricks here. So what we want to end up as we go through the entire cycle is with exactly the same image. That's why you end up with fairly terrifying looking equation. It's actually not that uh, terrifying looking equation, it's, it's simple. Uh, but maybe at first glance it looks awful, you know, because that, that's the loss function. Okay, this is truly my last slide. Uh, so with that, I, I don't have any conclusion slide. Uh, just to say, I'm, I'm hoping I made a case for differentiable digital twins. I think it's an absolutely exciting area. It's up, it's going to grow. One thing that I didn't mention, and that, that maybe is preempting a question, is I'm not saying only digital twins are the way forward. Everything has to be put in neural net or trained through the, uh, you know, uh, through the, that has to be differentiable. There's obviously a case for neural augment augmentation. So linking both and putting neural nets where you want and leaving some other aspects that may be handcrafted. Uh, I want to thank the whole team and NGCDI, absolute thrill. Uh, of, 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 of a job and an opportunity to work with so many smart people. Uh, so with that, thanks a lot. I'm hoping I've left enough time for some questions. Thanks a lot.